Um, okay, so our next presenter is Susan Bird. Sue holds degrees in agribusiness and animal science with focus on livestock production and range management. In addition to being a field inspector, Sue speaks to groups and landowners about invasive plants and general weed control. Uh, Sue believes education is key to prevention and control of noxious weeds. Totally agree. Please welcome Susan Bird. Thank you, everyone. This is a little different type of presentation than what we've seen all day today. Um, I am not a drone owner, and I am not a drone applicator, but I am a county weed um, control, noxious weed board field person. And we had, like all of you have probably had, some areas where it's just really difficult to get to our targets. And that promoted or prompted us to look into drone applications. And our process for drone applications started in 2018. We have an invasive Class A in Yakima County in Washington that is the only location known in the Pacific Northwest. And we're the only county in the state known to have it. We've been fighting this infestation of Oriental Clematis since 2010. And in 2018, um, I started looking into drone applications because there were just some areas, steep terrain, soft soil, wetlands, difficult to reach, um, not feasible for a fixed wing or helicopter application because of location and proximity to resident. Um, so we started looking at possibilities. And um, the process of a drone application in 2018 was non-existent in Washington State and in order to make it possible was very daunting. We looked at um, obtaining a drone for our own board. The expense was absolutely out of any price range we could afford. Um, we looked at the licensing requirements and the Department of Ag requirements and Washington State was very paranoid about potential drone applications. The ability for us to go in and have an applicator do something was unheard of. And there were a lot of interest, but there was a lot of naysayers saying this isn't going to happen. So we started the process of looking into what we could do with um, getting a drone somehow to applicate for a site that was not safe to access on foot or with vehicles. So in order to release anything, the FAA says you have to have a 137 um, to release any economic poison from the air. And that's how the FAA titled it for the 137.3. And that's really a detrimental phrase. So all of the herbicide applicators out here, we're trying to make the people in our communities comfortable with what we're doing. And the word poison is not a good word. Um, however, we knew that you have to go through these loops. And we try to explain these things to our, to our landowners, to the entities that we're working with, to make sure everybody's on the same page. But we get these licenses. Um, all of the states that I have talked to, you have to have your aerial applicator's license, as well as what type of applications you're making. So you're going to do a broadcast application. You need an applicator's license. If you're doing aquatics, you have to have an aquatics applicator's license under that drone operator. The person supervising it doesn't, I mean, I have all those. But my drone operator had to have all of those as well. And so it wasn't something that I could go in and say, okay, I'm the supervisor for the site and I hold a license, can they spray under me? And it was an absolute no. And so we had to start making sure that our drone potential was able to get those applicators licenses as well. So these are a couple of the difficult to treat locations that we're using drones for in Yakima County. And one of the challenges is to, to discuss the benefits of drone survey and treatment with our landowners. There's a lot of fear of the uncertain of aerial anything. And so making sure our landowners and our um, entities that we're working with, be it state or federal agencies or local agencies, are aware of the benefits. You know, you're decreasing your human exposure. You're decreasing your environmental hazards to those people on the ground, be it animal, terrain, herbicide exposure. Um, limiting the amount of product that you're using. So instead of spraying an entire acre, you might only spray a 10-foot area. Um, improved mapping abilities. Uh, we have gained so many amazing maps through the drone technology that we're using um, that goes directly into our database. It 
limits time mapping. These drones provide the map when they're doing the survey, when they're doing the spraying. Um, limits manpower and time. So you have a couple people operating this drone treatment process instead of a dozen people on feet with backpacks. Um, and it provides access to areas that we are not safely accessing or easily accessing with equipment or on foot. So this is our initial um, spray site in, that we were trying to get to. We've been trying to control the clematis. It's a 37 acre wetland with um, deciduous forestry, a lot of brush, um, a lot of vines. The slough on that side um, where the truck is parked, that's a sedimentary silt. And so every time you put pressure on it, it collapses and falls and sloughs. And we were dropping hose lines down over this and sending hikers down in through the bottom to get the hoses. And it just made really hard to reach areas difficult to treat. So site surveys are always a first step. Um, you have to know what your target is and whether or not a aerial survey is going to be effective and efficient and economical. Sometimes you can walk into an area on foot or drive into an area and it's totally feasible to do the entire survey on the ground. Um, unfortunately, we have a lot more areas in the wilderness and in open areas that we are not actively developed that an aerial eye from the sky is going to give us a better picture of what we're targeting and how to get in there and hit it. We may not, it may not justify a drone application, but having a drone survey that you can look at the picture from above to say, okay, you need to get to this point and this point and this point could save days of trying to hike through this terrain to access those points and survey and map. So we've had um, aerial surveys of big sites done and then it takes some time after those surveys are done to look at those surveys and plot, okay, this is our target and this is where we're at. So survey time is important. Um, knowing what your target is and, and what it looks like from a distance helps a lot and then being diligent in including our community in what we're doing. So the fear of the unknown um, is really huge. And there are a lot of people who say, if something flies over my property, I'm gonna shoot it down, I don't care what it is. So being able to communicate the benefits of what we're doing, the target of why we're doing it, and including those landowners and the community members in what we're doing is gonna alleviate a lot of those fears Transparency is an absolute must. So before putting an air, a drone in the air, we talk to everyone within a half a mile of that survey or treatment. I send out letters a couple months in advance, so it is a very time-consuming process to make sure everybody's on board. We make sure that those landowners are educated about our target, what we're there, why we're there, how long we're going to be there, and the desired end results of what we're doing. I always get written permission from any landowner that I will be flying a drone over. Whether we're treating the property or not, if there is potential for that drone to be over five feet over their property, I get a written permission from them that says they acknowledge what we're doing, they're aware of what we're doing before we ever do it. So this is a letter um, for the Oriental Clematis that we send out. It's a, a very brief introduction, a picture of our target, a little description of our goal, and contact information for them to contact us and ask questions. So it's the first letter and then when we get a date ironed out of we're gonna try to treat between May 3rd and May 7th of this particular site, we'll notify them of that as well in advance. So this is the control panel of the first drone survey we had done. I had sent that drone operator the GPS map of the plot we needed surveyed. It's 37 acres. As you can see, it's at the border of a city limits and it's between the city and the freeway. So that operator had to know he could not fly over the freeway. He could not fly over the city of Zilla. So he had to have his flight paths pretty well marked before he ever got to the site. And we're going to hope this video shows. Um, the initial surveys were done showing us how many target areas of oriental clematis we had. Um, right there hanging down from the tree is one of them. At the base of the cliff there are several. We were able to plot points with this survey of where we had not been able to get to prior. So we had hiked all over this 37 acres. 
with machetes and chainsaws and clearing paths and using hip waders and trying to get to these. And we didn't know where our targets were. So having this aerial survey was able to, they actually gave us a hard photocopy of the map from the air as well as the video of the survey. We were able to stand on top of that cliff and say, okay, can you look closer into these trees? And he was able to drop his survey drone down in and spin around and give us some really good footage. So it was very exciting in 2018, um, the ability to see these targets that we had never been able to actually pinpoint prior. So the drone applicator, my slide seems to be a little out of order, but I'll go through this. Um, the drone applicator must have a spotter. So you need a couple eyes in the sky that are looking for obstacles that that drone may or may not detect. We're looking for little tiny tree branches. We're looking for eagles coming in. We're looking for airplanes, whatever. You just need an extra set of eyes in the sky that that operator doesn't have to worry about. Be aware of flight paths, restrictions, airports. There's so many little things that the operator and the drone company have to have um, just to be aware of in order to make these applications. So this is the year before um, we started the application process with a drone. We extended our nozzles 20 feet with a galvanized pipe to reach out over cliff banks. Um, we hiked through shoulder deep brush and debris trying to get to some of these points that we were able to find with the survey drone. Um, I have some technical issues here telling me it needs to configure something, so we'll try to get past it. Um, so we started discussing with a land-based vegetation management company the potential of a possible drone acquisition in 2020. And they came back to me in 2021 and said they were trying to buy the drone and get into the process. So that was pretty cool. Um, but with all applications, you will have some collateral damage. And especially with ground applications, sometimes you have to treat more in order to get your target. And these trees show what we could hit from the ground and the yellow circles show where we missed and the clematis was persistent. One of the things about oriental clematis is it will germinate in a nest or a, a branch of a tree and grow down. So you can't necessarily treat the ground around the tree and still kill the vine that's growing inside it. It's very, very persistent. So this is another one. We dropped the hose down over a 200 foot cliff. We hiked into the bottom, took the hose, shimmied out on a tree that was kind of in the river. So there's a lot of risk to personal um, injury, for terrain, for habitat. We're just you know, pushing the spectrum of what OSHA would like this to not do <laughs> in trying to control invasive species. But this is a class A, which is a mandatory eradication, if at all possible. And so we're looking at trying to keep this as a class A and prevent growth in areas that are next to impossible to get to. So having worked with the department on ground and the vegetation management crew that helped us, they purchased a drone in 2021 and made our project their first pilot project. So we were the first drone spray application conducted in Washington State. Um, the ability to go into these areas and hit these targets for the first time ever was absolutely amazing. Uh, you just can't describe it. And so um, we were able to hit 75% of our targets in that 37 acre area. We had about 25% of them that we didn't feel comfortable hitting with a first time drone operator. Um, he had done some practice flying, but he didn't, hadn't done any actual application flying because this was his first project. So we avoided the tree branches. We had a couple spots we couldn't hit, but we got a 100% kill of the targets he was able to hit. And that is amazing. Um, in the weed management, that is just really unheard of. And so this is one of them over the cliff bank. Um, I had to record it with a phone from a distance because that cliff had sloughed back over 30 feet in the last 10 years. Um, and if you look down in that little V of the cliff, there's an oriental clematis patch. And when the rotors of the drone start hitting it, we were able to say, okay, enable spraying. And he hit that patch. And as soon as he flew over and you can see, the only wind movement we had that day was from the rotors of the drone. We had a very light breeze. It wasn't causing anything else to move. So I think if you watch real close down in that corner, you'll see the wind start to move those branches. And he was able to hit that for the first time in 25 years. I've been watching that patch and could never get to it. Our extension nozzles weren't quite long enough. 
we tried working with um, standing you know downwind a little bit and letting it blow into it all kinds of different things and this is the first time we were able to hit it and we got a full kill on that site so aerial surveys are of difficult to reach areas are really important they're not always required but they give you that data that you would not have doing a ground field survey so this is a, um, a little tiny drone. It's about 12 inches across. It does a survey. He did a survey of 87 acres in less than an hour. So that was pretty cool. I gave him the parcel map of where we were at. And I don't have a, a pointer, but if you look at the curve area on the far side of that little blue highlight, we had been able to drive down into the lower field and treat with a drone the cliff bank below those pastures on top the year prior. What we had not been able to do is survey the 87 acres um, adjacent to that property. And with an aerial survey, we found one location of Clematis. Had we had to do that survey on foot, it would have taken us a couple weeks. Um, and who knows whether or not the Clematis would have already bloomed. So we were able to survey and treat that. We treated it the following week. Um, and we were able to get that clematis under control. This is a ground site that we treated. So oriental clematis loves Russian olive. We really tried to say, well, the clematis can kill the olive and then we can go in and can kill the clematis, but the Department of Ag didn't like that. They didn't want to wait. So we did ground applications. We always had stuff in the top of these trees that we could not reach from the ground. So another June 30th of 2022 application is the drone application of that site. Now with this site, we used an aquatic approved pesticide because it was along a canal bank, an irrigation district. We also used a drift retardant to prevent it from affecting the orchard adjacent to us. Now it was several hundred feet from where we were spraying to where that orchard was, but we wanted to make sure that it was staying where we were at. I like this particular drone and it's similar to the one out there because it has the two cameras you can see down below and out in front of it. And if you watch, it enables the spraying we used a lot of highlights so we could see that our target was being hit. Um, when it comes to an obstacle, it disables spraying on its own. And then the pilot had to reorient where he was at, adjusted his elevation, and continued the process. And if you watch on the top of this bar, you'll see that the payload is in a white oval. That tells you how much product you still have in the tank. And as it starts to dwindle, it's telling the operator you're getting close to empty, um, you know, your plan on whatever your spray is. The drone plots the point where it emptied and stopped spraying and will go directly back to that point if it's needed. So that's one of the time-saving devices. Um, this spray patch was a little over 200 feet from where our home base was, where the drone was taking off of and landing. Um, and with this project, we sprayed um, less than a tenth of an acre in about 15 minutes. And so we were able to get in there, get the site approached, do the spraying. He finds another patch of clematis down there in that tree. It's gonna go in and enable spraying, turn it blue. We like blue dye. Um, and so returning to this site the following year, there was no clematis return um, and then um, spring of 24 we're anxiously anticipating that there's nothing that's going to be there so the drone disabled its brain because it was empty and it returned to home a really really cool technology we're using this particular company to do some phragmites controls um, on a bureau of reclamation project that is a federal project so they had to get special permissions to use dji technology um, for some reason the feds don't like technology from china so um, it was a permissions issue, a little brief video. So they treated um, a little over 10 acres in a couple hours with the DJI 10, um, which is the one that's sitting out there. This map was generated as it was sprayed. So the minute they were completed, he emailed me the map. I knew exactly the acreage, how much product was used, how long it took them. All of the weather conditions were con were saved on this mapping technology. So then the next uh, couple weeks later, um, they were finished with hop harvest, which is the field to the right of that. And they went back in and did some spot spraying, just manually controlled. 
And I liked this one, which is also near that hop field, because it shows the riparian area that they used to have to take four um, ATVs across. Um, they've had tractors stuck. This is a restoration area, so the goal is to never take mechanized vehicles across it again. Um, they were able to treat this in less than an hour, multiple sites would have taken days with somebody in waders to backpack and treat purple loosestrife and phragmites in this wetland. So they sent me this video. I wasn't on site, but they put a bunch of dye in the water and they were just trying to get the idea of the vortex of the spray drone. So this is a, also out on the restoration area. You can kind of see the downward pressure from the rotors. You can see the swirl and vortex. So that one of the things that that does is it makes sure that your application is hitting that entire plant, not just the top. That vortex moves that herbicide around. So you want to be careful. There's always air movement with rotor movement. So you got to be careful of drift. You have to be careful of what adjacent crops are. Um, but you do that with all applications. So this is just one of those extra tools that we absolutely love. This is a bridge site um, in central Washington. It's 665 feet from the deck of the bridge to where I'm standing in the bottom of the canyon. Um, we had a bunch of scotch thistle on this site that we could not safely access from the top or the bottom. And the plateau in the middle is a culturally sensitive tribal spiritual site. So even though it belonged to the DOT, Yakima Nation says you're not taking mechanized equipment across that property. It's not within the reservation boundaries, but they still have a little bit of say in the cultural sensitive locations. And we wanted to honor and respect that and keep them positive with this, um, present, with this particular application. So we again used some highlights so that we could see where they were treating. A good pair of binoculars, you could see the rosettes all over that hillside. And so we painted about 16 acres of shale slide and hillside with um, spot applications for this drone use and treated an area that we have never been able to get to. So it has multiple years of scotch thistle regeneration, the seed bank is there. And so drone technology enabled us for the first time to apply to that site without rattlesnake bites, um, which the rattlesnakes are very thick in this area. We don't have a hiker trying to slide up those, trying to, to backpack it. It was just a really cool um, application. And then this one is a Columbia or a Kawichi Basin project, which is west of Yakima, um, near the foothills of the Cascades. So the Oak Creek um, Fish and Wildlife Area is in the background. And there are a lot of draws. Again, this video is kind of shaky, so I'm only going to show a minute of it. But it shows some of the terrain of where we're trying to access for the hard to reach. And I know this is a, an aquatic invasive, but this allows us to treat anything anywhere to be able to access and get to stuff that we couldn't get to before. Whether it's aquatic or terrestrial, drone technology is improving our ability to find and treat faster. So in, like the little seasick motion, we had, a, we had a loose camera connection, so it liked to wobble. But the treatment area was 2,000 feet from where we were taking off and landing. Um, so it was able to fly out. We were able to see the site with the binoculars, so we knew that it was the correct treat it, treatment area. And then he was able to get out there and treat it. So the white lines are the flight path to and from. Um, the T-10 only carries eight liters of fluid because that's an FAA restriction. It carries 10. We're only allowed to carry eight because you don't want to maximize the 55-pound weight load. So we were using eight liters of liquid. Um, it would take about 15 minutes per battery to go through about half of the liquid payload we had, but we finished um, about 16 acres of treatment in four hours and got to stuff that we can never get to unless you went in on horseback with a backpack. And so those were, those were pretty impressive treatments. And the final treatment that we did in 2023 was Japanese knotweed on the river, and they were areas that our crews that went in on backpacks and with canoes could not access. The river was too swift, the rocks were too shallow. We couldn't get in there with a flat boat because of the hazards on the river. So the yellow lines were the map that I gave the drone company before they got to the scene, showing access to the points. Um, the little purple dots were the Japanese knotweed sites. Hard to tell. 
So in, in about two minutes, we were able to treat this site from launch to land. Um, it's about a 10 foot, maybe 15 foot patch of Japanese knotweed. Again, it was on an island we couldn't get to and access. And so we used this. Um, you can see the air movement when the drum gets over it. He takes a little bit of time and figures out manually what he was going to do. It wasn't one that he was able to target, program into his drum. So this was all done manually. And you can see the movement of the knotweed. This isn't done under our NPDES because it is along the river. We were using aquatic herbicides. And he was able to treat that knotweed site in just a couple minutes. And there's his flight back from where the arrow sits across the island, did the treatment and came back. And then from a similar point, we had to relocate to get to the one across the river from us. Again, it was a fairly small patch of knotweed. We've been watching for a couple years, trying to figure out how to get to it. And even when the river's low, the obstacles were too, too much to safely put a person on foot or in a boat. He gets out over it, we can see the movement of the leaves, and he enabled spray. So we used, uh, between the two locations, it was a tenth of an acre. Um, that was surveyed and, and I don't remember, I don't think we used a third of a, of a container of herbicide. So with drone applications, lessons learned. Open conversations with landowners and residents are essential. Making sure that all of the constituents that have an interest in what you're doing have a positive information and attitude from you. Be educated about your project. If you can answer their questions, knowledgeably and be able to get information that they request, they're more likely to be positive about that application. So drone technology, drone applications are increasing all the time. We went from one company in central Washington to five in the last two years that have drone application abilities. We have one company in central Washington that has the ability to swarm their drones so they can link three drones together and do massive applications at a time. He has 17 pilots. Their smallest project is 500 acres. They won't accept anything smaller than that. So they did different settings, different abilities, and enable different projects. I will never have a 500 acre project in what I'm doing. However, I have landowners that have thousands of acres that are very interested in the big drug companies. So knowing what's available to landowners and to the constituents, good information, good equipment, don't be afraid to apply for grants. There's a lot of money out there. You just have to look for it. All they can do is tell you no, but they're more likely to tell you yes if you apply for it. If you don't try, you will never know. Drones are an amazing tool to add to the toolbox, but they are a tool. They're not a cure-all. They're not going to fix it all. They're not going to treat it all, but they are an amazing tool. The benefits of advancing technology is incredible. And to be able to watch these sites that I've been trying to physically get into for the last 15, 20 years, be treated in a morning is really cool. I mean, I hope they take my job from me because it's just one of those things they can do, you know. As land managers are shown the potentials and the benefits, more and more of them are going to be interested and amicable to drone treatment. And we're going to get better coverage, better early detection, and better rapid response through use of this technology. And with that, I thank you for your time. Are there any questions? Make sure your drone operator is knowledgeable about that requirement. 
They have to have a 107, which is what every pilot that puts anything in the air has to have, is my understanding, is the 107 is anything to operate anything in the air, and the 137 is anything that you're going to be dispensing something from. So if you're gonna be dropping seeds, or herbicide, or vegetative matter, or water, if you're dispensing anything from the air, you need a 137. Yes. Uh, for your uh, larger treatment polygons, uh, how how wide do uh, your transects have to be uh, when you spray? That's a good question for one of the drone companies. So I, I'm sorry, I can't answer that. Good question. Anybody else? Again, thank you for your time.